please turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and follow along as I read the words of the living God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Almighty God, and I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would bless the reading of your word, that you would bless now the preaching of your word. Surely you are a mighty God, for you are willing and able to work through finite and, and, and frail and fragile men to convey the message of your gospel. And you would only do such a thing if you were powerful enough to cause uh, all that you intend, all that you've decreed to succeed. You glorify and magnify your name. Thank you for the undeserved gift of being able to stand before your people this Lord's day. I pray that they would be built up. I pray that above all, they would adore Christ a little more today than they did yesterday for what they will learn from your word. Father, forgive us our, our foolishness. Forgive us our waywardness, our unwillingness to submit and yield to your law. We think we know better, but we are the creature. You are the creator. And sorrow upon sorrow is in our foolishness we pass over so many blessings, so many delights. In our foolishness, we pass by the gift that you have given us in the Sabbath, in the Lord's Day, a day that you have given to us because you love us. You have not demanded that we work seven days out of seven. You've given us a day of rest because you are a good God and you are a kind God. You are the kind and benevolent King of this universe, creator of all things, and you ordained that men would work six days and rest one. Let us submit to your rulership, I pray, and above all, as we already asked, may it not be that our end is delight in the Sabbath, but in delight in the Lord of the Sabbath. We love you and praise you in his name, Jesus Christ. The years 1789 to 1799 
present a time in world history that few, uh, at least in our country today, uh, are familiar with at all. Most people today don't know much about those years, but nonetheless, they are extremely significant, especially from the perspective of worldview analysis. Uh, most Americans are at least vaguely familiar with the American Revolution, right? Probably because we celebrate it once a year, so we at least know of it. Uh, but even then, fewer and fewer would be able to articulate the foundational principles that gave rise to what we call the War for Independence. Few would be able to explain why the war happened, and this definitely not uh, what the worldview reasons or presuppositions behind uh, what happened, what those, what those were. As history books are written and rewritten, and history is told through the values of a culture long bereft of the Lordship of Christ, as what is important to the postmodern man is recorded over what was important to those who have gone before, much is lost. Words are given new definitions, and if a principle or a perspective is deemed to be unacceptable by the obviously superior enlightened minds of the present, the principle or perspective is either ignored or reinterpreted. But what really happened in the 18th century was extremely significant and has had an incalculable impact on the world as we know it. Though we may not know it, it has impacted us drastically. It could be summed up in this way. It could be summed up as <clears throat> the choosing of two very different paths by two very different peoples for two very different reasons. Two great experiments were conducted during this time, and two very different results were come to. The twin revolutions in America and in France will forever be, at least as long as accurate history is kept, a lesson to the diligent student of history. From the perspective of worldview analysis, one could say that what we have in the American and French revolutions is the test of what are ultimately the two great worldviews. Encapsulated in these two revolutions, we have what are ultimately the two great worldviews. In America, the worldview, and thus the revolution that began it, was one that, at its foundation, recognized that there is a God, He is to be feared, and it is from Him that all things flow. That was at foundation, at base, recognized in the thinking of the founders of our country. Those who say, today especially, that we were not founded as a Christian nation are simply determined, really, to reveal uh, their own stubborn inability to articulate their contention against uh, anything that they disagree with. They just dislike something. They're not able to uh, justify their position historically, uh, so they simply demand that it must be true. Weak minds and weak stomachs often come in pairs. Take, for example, the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Basically, when, when two people, groups, two countries, or two groups of people are going to break ties, just basic decency under God uh, compels those groups to at least say why. Why are we going to part ways? That's what that's saying. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are, probably most of you could say them, at least I would certainly hope so, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It then goes on to explain that the purpose of government is to secure or protect those rights, and that, that the government of the United Kingdom had failed in its God-given responsibilities. After examples of this are given, uh, of the failure of the United Kingdom, to protect the rights of the American colonies after those examples are given, the document concludes with, quote, and for the support of this declaration, 
with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. End quote. So, very clear worldview statements in this document. And it's just one example among many and many documents that are even clearer uh, since uh, the inception of this country. So, uh, very clear worldview statements of the that, that make very uh, make very clear. I keep saying that very clear worldview statements that um, prove or expose certain things about the American worldview. As we said, the American wor worldview was founded on the presuppositions. These things were already agreed upon, self-evident, that there is a God. He is to be feared, and from Him all things flow. Now, the French Revolution was basically the opposite. The French Revolution was basically the opposite. The worldview that set things in motion in France was based upon the presuppositions that man is supreme, man is to be feared, and from man all things flow. That was the French Revolution. It was a humanistic campaign all the way through. The people were the ultimate authority and arbiter of truth, justice, equity, and so on. And just as the worldview of the uh, American Revolution can be seen in its founding documents, so the worldview of the French Revolution can be seen in its founding document, which is titled Declaration of the Rights of Man. The preamble reads, quote, The representatives of the French people organized as a national assembly, believing that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole cause of public calamities and of the corruption of governments, we, the French people, have determined to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural, unalienable, and sacred rights of man, in order that this declaration, being constantly before all the members of the social body, shall remind them continually of their rights and duties, in order that the acts of the legislative power, as well as those of the executive, may be compared at any moment with the objects and purposes of all political institutions, and may thus be more respected. So basically this is being written to remind us of what we believe, what our purposes are, what the purpose of government is. And lastly, in order that the grievances of the citizens, based hereafter upon simple and incontestable principles, shall tend to the maintenance of the Constitution and redound to the happiness of all. Therefore, the National Assembly recognizes and proclaims in the presence and under the auspices of the Supreme Being the following rights of man and of the citizen. End quote. That's the preamble to the Declaration of the Rights of Men. Really one of the founding documents of the French Revolution, the French Republic. And at first glance, or maybe at first hearing, uh, the two documents sound rather similar in some respects. One might even point out that in the Declaration of the Rights of Men, uh, there was an appeal to a supreme being, right? But who was the supreme being in the minds of those who wrote that document? That's the question. Who was the supreme being? In the American Declaration of Independence, the truth was recognized that God is the source of authority, rights, and law. He is the supreme being. That's very clear. And they were correct, of course. But, but who is the source of such things, of of authority, rights, and law, and the declaration of the rights of man, of men. The answer, of course, will reveal the worldview of the French Revolution. The sixth article of the Declaration of the Rights of Men, the sixth article begins with this statement. And the answer is going to be found in it. Law is the expression of the general will. Law is the expression of the general will. About as humanistic of a statement as it comes. Law is not the expression of the general will. But this statement, and others if we had time, if we wanted to look more into the document, reveal that the supreme being of the, of the French Revolution was man. The supreme being of the French Revolution was man. It was not God, it was man. And this really exposes the foundational difference between the worldviews of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Revolution. But the French Revolution was not merely different from the American one. It was not merely different. It, 
it was antithetical to it. It was opposite to it. It was, a, it was against it. The two were opposed to one another. Many of the prominent voices and leaders of the Enlightenment who became prophets, so to speak, of the French Revolution wanted to see the eradication of religion. They weren't content merely with offering a different uh, perspective. They wanted to see the eradication of religion. And in many ways, they succeeded for a time. They wanted to replace religion, and Christianity in particular, with science and politics. So again, in, in the French Revolution, in, in their movement, they wanted to eradicate religion and replace it with science and politics. And, and this was all, all in accord with the desires of, again, their so-called prophets, their enlightened prophets, which had come really kind of the decades before. I'll quote a few now. Some of the names may found, uh, sound familiar. Voltaire, quote, Every sensible man, every honorable man, must hold the Christian religion in horror, end quote. Diderot, quote, Man will never be free until the last king is strangled by the entrails of the last priest, end quote. Baron Dolbach, Quote, religion has ever filled the mind of man with darkness and kept him in ignorance of the real duties of true interests. It is only by dispelling these clouds and phantoms of religion that we shall discover truth, reason, and morality. Religion diverts us from the causes of evil and from the remedies which nature prescribes. Far from curing, it only aggravates, multiplies, and perpetuates them. So these are some of the prophets, uh, so to speak, that led up to the French Revolution, these, these enlightened, quote-unquote, men. And seeking to fulfill these prophecies, the French uh, enacted many uh, things, among which uh, was a new calendar. They actually started a new calendar, which began not with the year of our Lord, but the year that their revolution began. Uh, this is a really interesting time if you've never looked into this. Uh, this all actually happened. But more to our point, and maybe you've been wondering what in the world we're talking about all this for, more to our point, in order to accomplish the eradication of religion and, and accomplish the heinous things that we just heard quoted, they abolished the seven-day week. They abolished the seven-day week. Thinking themselves wise, they changed to a ten-day week. They changed to a ten-day week. Interestingly, uh, the tenth day was still a day of rest. Uh, I can't, it's a little bit harder, I think, to convince people to get rid of that one. The people would gather on that tenth day. Instead of gathering to worship God, of course, they would discuss politics and science, which really functionally were the gods uh, of the French Revolution. The nation raged, and the people plotted against the Lord and his anointed. And where did they strike when they raged? Where did they strike? At the creation week. At the creation week thinking that they could cast off the chains of religion. They began working for nine days and resting for one. Now, I don't know if maybe some of you have ever been to France, um, or if you know anything about it or how much you know about it, but um, if you have been, you will know that they do not operate on a 10-day week today. Uh, it's, it's, it failed. It did not work. No surprise, probably there to most of us, it failed. The French Revolution ended with tyranny, after tens of thousands were beheaded, literally the streets running with blood. There also uh, are reports that, that injuries and deaths increased while production decreased when the 10-day when the week was in effect. The American Revolution, on the other hand, spurred centuries of unprecedented peace and prosperity. Though we see today, of course, as the American worldview changes, how quickly we may be heading off the same cliff which our French neighbors plunged so long ago. Uh, perhaps not all that surprising. <laughs> I wish they would have waited a little longer. They, I'm sure walking in on that would have sounded a little strange. Some of them. Sadly, there are attempts today, even in France, um, to go the opposite direction, limiting the work week to four days. That's the topic um, of discussion now. And then they would rest for three. Uh, their motivation for this is that that they say is that they would avoid the burnout of the laborers. And this is just another example of, of how man will do anything to avoid obedience to 
God. They are yet again utterly missing the point. Sabbath rest is not merely, as we will see, the cessation of one's work involving secular vocation. That, that's not it. It is rest from one's own non-religious pleasures as well. What are our theme verses? What are our theme verses for our study? Isaiah 58. If you haven't marked that, that'd be good, at least until our time is done. Isaiah 58, 13 through 14. If you turn your back, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Rest on the Lord's day means delighting ourselves in the Lord of the Sabbath. The French, if they wanted to, could only work three days. And if they fill the rest of the week with their own pleasures and delights, they will suffer both body and soul. I brought all this up not to prove what we studied last time. That's not why I gave this example. See what happened? This proves the Bible true. We don't prove the Bible true. The Bible doesn't need to be proven true. Okay. I brought it up as an example of, of those biblical truths, though, that we studied not last week, but two weeks ago. I brought them up as an example of those truths being expressed in history, coming to fruition in history. As a product of the creation week, and as we will see in a moment, with the works of the law written on their hearts, humans know that the cycle of one day of rest in seven is a part of the design of their creator. They may kick against the goads, but they will never ultimately succeed. The uh, French rebel rebellion really aggravated, though, all the more by the fact that, that God has made known to man by special revelation, not merely uh, the works of the law being written on our heart and knowing generally that there is a time for rest, but he, he has made known to us by special revelation how many days are for work and rest, as well as which day it is in which men are to rest. This has been revealed to us by God in special revelation in Scripture. Turn now to chapter 22 in paragraph 7 of the Confession. Chapter 22 in paragraph 7. The light of nature speaks generally of a portion of time, but by his word, God has revealed a, quote, positive moral and perpetual commandment that obligates everyone in every age. Uh, specifically, he has appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy to him. From the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, the appointed day was the last day of the week, which is Saturday. So our focus this Lord's Day, this time, is on the Sabbath, not as a creation ordinance, that was our focus last time, but as the Sabbath as an aspect of the moral law. The Sabbath as an aspect of the moral law. Now we'll see that uh, it, it is part of the moral, uh, being part of, part of the moral law of God, as all of the moral law of God is, it will therefore be unique, timeless, and indivisible. The moral law of God is unique, timeless, and indivisible. Those are the three points that we'll be making about the moral law of God. We're not going to waste our time uh, defending the fact that the Sabbath is part of the moral law, right? Because we just read it. We just read it in Exodus chapter 20, so we're not going to make that a whole point by itself, defending that it is part of the moral law. It is, but remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, verse 8 of chapter 20 of Exodus. Uh, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And notice the appeal to the creation ordinance. 
in those verses. There's an appeal to the creation ordinance. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, because of this, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The Sabbath was not created at Sinai. The Sabbath was not created at Sinai. In fact, at Sinai was not the first time that God's people were even commanded to observe it. Sinai was not the first time that the, that the Israelites were commanded to observe the Sabbath. Turn to uh, Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16. Starting in verse 1, they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent." And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less, but when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning, as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The one living and true God, 
provided food for his people six days with enough to gather on the sixth that they might eat and rest on the seventh. That's what just happened in the story we just read. The, the Israelites, prone uh, to play the harlot and look to other so-called gods, even often claiming that it was those gods who had provided for them in the past, they would not be able to deny that it was the God who made all things, the heavens and the earth, and who rested on the seventh, who was now providing for them. By obeying his command to rest, they were recognizing that it was this God, the one living and true God, the only true and living God, who had provided for them. That's, that's why it is important. It, it, it symbolizes whom God is. The God who rested on the seventh, worked six and rested on the seventh. Uh, they were recognizing him by doing the same. And how sad it is that some refused still, as we read, uh, to recognize di divine benevolence. They, they refused to recognize d divine benevolence. Hear, hear him implore. Hear the divine one implore in verses 28 through 29. How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. The Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. The Sabbath was made for man. It was made for man. It's a gift. It's an an expression of the goodness, the kindness, and the gentleness of God. It's given to be a delight. And how slow are the people of God to receive his graces? How slow are the people of God to receive his graces? And so often, once refusing them and, and then suffering want in what those means of graces would have provided, how quick are they to complain that he's not gracious enough? Far be it from us. Be it from us. Before we move on to understanding the uniqueness, the timelessness, and the indivisibility of the moral law, and that is the major three components of our study this afternoon, before we go on to study those, I think it will be helpful to clear up some confusion surrounding the Mosaic law. Um, some try to make the Sabbath to be part of another category of the Mosaic law. Some try to make the Sabbath to be part of another category of the Mosaic Law, and they do this in order to defend their refusal to observe it. Uh, it's not that they deny, obviously, that it was Old Testament law. We just read it. They can't deny that it was Old Testament law. But it's that they try to treat it as if it was part of the ceremonial law and not part of the moral law. Okay, Many, in their attempts to refuse the Sabbath, to refuse to observe the Sabbath, treat it as ceremonial law rather than moral law. Turn now to chapter 19 of the Confession. Chapter 19. Which is 39, if you have the same book. Page 39. Paragraph 1. God gave Adam a law of comprehensive obedience written in his heart, and as a and a specific precept not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By these, God obligated him and all his descendants to personal, total, exact, and perpetual obedience. God promised life if Adam fulfilled it, and threatened death if he broke it. And he gave Adam the power and the ability to keep it. Paragraph 2. The same law that was written, that was first written in the human heart, continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness after the fall. It was delivered by God on Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments and was written in two tables. The first four commandments contain our duty to God and the other six our duty to humanity. Paragraph 3. In addition to this law, usually called the moral law, God was pleased to give the people of Israel ceremonial laws containing several typological ordinances. In some ways, these concerned worship by prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits. In other ways, they revealed various instructions about moral duties. Since all of these ceremonial laws were appointed only until the new order arrived, they are now abolished and taken away by Jesus Christ. As the true Messiah and the only lawgiver, 
He was empowered by the Father to do this. Paragraph 4. To Israel, he also gave various judicial laws, which ceased at the, at the same time their nation ended. These laws no longer obligate anyone as part of that institution. Only their general principles of justice continue to have moral value. Paragraph 5. The moral law forever requires obedience of everyone, both those who are justified as well as others. This obligation arises not only because of its content, but also because of the authority of God, the Creator, who gave it. Nor does Christ in any way dissolve this obligation in the Gospel. Instead, he greatly strengthens it. Paragraph 6. True believers are not under the law as a covenant of works, praise God, to be justified or condemned by it. Yet it is very useful to them and to others as a rule of life that informs them of the will of God and their duty. It directs and obligates them to live according to its precepts. It also exposes the sinful corruptions of their, na of their natures, hearts, and lives. As they examine themselves in the light of the law, they come to further conviction of, humiliation for, and hatred of sin, along with a clearer view of their need for Christ and the perfection of his obedience. The law is also useful to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions because it forbids sin. The punishment threatened by the law shows them what even their sins deserve and what troubles they may expect in this life due to their sin, even though they are freed from the curse and undiminished severity of it. The promises of the law likewise show them God's approval of obedience and the blessings they may expect when they keep it, even though these blessings are not owed to them by the law as a covenant of works. If people do good and refrain from evil because the law encourages good and discourages evil, that does not indicate that they are under the law. If people do good and refrain from evil because the law encourages good and discourages evil, that does not indicate that they are under the law and not under grace. These uses, paragraph 7, of the law are not contrary to the grace of the gospel, but are in sweet harmony with it. For the Spirit of Christ subdues and enables the human will to do freely and cheerfully what the will of God, as revealed in the law, requires. There are many wonders spoken of in that chapter of the Confession, truly wonders. And that's why I wanted to introduce it, the whole thing to you and just go ahead and read through it. But uh, what we're seeking to learn today is that the Mosaic Law is generally understood in three parts. You should have noticed that in there. There's the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the judicial law, broadly speaking. That's, that's the Mosaic law split up into three parts. Now that we have read Exodus 20, it should be beyond doubt that the Sabbath is part of the moral law, which as the confession states, was written on the human heart before the fall. It is not part of the ceremonial or judicial law, which found their fulfillment in Christ and therefore are no longer in force except for their general principles. It is part of the moral law, which is unique, timeless, and indivisible. The ceremonial laws were typological. You probably recognize that word in there. They were typological, meaning they revealed something of the coming Messiah. They, they were a foreshadowing of him. They taught something of what could be expected of the one who would save his people from their sins. When Christ came, he fulfilled all those typological foreshadowings, and thereby, since they were fulfilled, rendering them no longer necessary. Since they were fulfilled in him, and they were foreshadowing him and foretelling him, they were no longer necessary once he came. In one sense, therefore, it is, actually, it is, it is wrong, depending on your definition of the word, uh, though recognizing, of course, the word is used in the confession, um, to say that Christ abolished any of the Mosaic Law. Say that he abolished any of it. Instead, uh, maybe better, uh, or at least by uh, expressing uh, the difference between the two words, you'll get what I'm saying. Uh, he fulfilled them. And in their fulfillment, some, like the ceremonial laws, are satisfied and no longer active. And others, the moral law, are fulfilled in the sense that they find their fullest expression and strength in the gospel. They're, they're, they don't lose strength in the gospel. In fact, they find their fullest expression 
and strengthen the gospel, the moral laws. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Starting in, we're picking up at verse 17. <clears throat> do not think, this says our Lord, this is our Lord speaking, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whatever he's speaking of here, clearly, we do not want to relax them want to relax them. John Gill in his commentary explains a little bit more deeply on, on what Christ our Lord is expressing here. Quote, by the law is meant the moral law. And that's evident in the following discourse he says. It, it appears, it's, it's apparent from the following discourse. He goes on to say, you have heard it said, and then he says, but I say to you, he expounds upon particularly the moral law. Uh, hate, adultery, those things. Murder, adultery. Uh, this he came not to destroy or loose men's obligations to as a rule of walk and conversation, but to fulfill it, which he did doctrinally by setting it forth fully and giving the true sense and meaning of it, and practically by yielding perfect obedience to all its commands, whereby he became the end the fulfilling end of it. By the prophets, that's what he meant by the law, by the prophets are meant the writings of the prophets in which they illustrated and explained the law of Moses, urged the duties of it, encouraged men thereunto by promises, and directed the people to the Messiah and to an expectation of the blessings of grace by him. All which explanations, promises, and prophecies were so far from being made void by Christ that they received their full accomplishment in him. And whenever he, that is Christ, or any other of the apostles, speaks of the abrogation of the law, it is to be understood of the ceremonial law, which in course ceased by being fulfilled. Or, if our Lord or the apostles speak of the moral law being abolished, it's not of the matter of the moral law, but of the ministry of it. And we will see that as we, as we come to see the, how uh, the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The matter didn't change, the Sabbath doesn't change, but the ministry of the Sabbath changed from uh, Saturday to Sunday. Matthew Henry echoes Gill. Quote, Christ commands nothing now which was forbidden either by the law of nature or the moral law, nor forbids anything which those laws had enjoined. It is a great mistake to think he does. And he here takes care to rectify the mistake. I am not come to destroy. The savior of souls is the destroyer of nothing but the works of the devil of nothing that comes from God, much less of those excellent dictates which we have from Moses and the prophets. No, he came to fulfill them. He did not make them void, but make good the ceremonial law and manifested himself to be the substance of all those shadows. It is a great mistake, Matthew Henry says, to think that he made void, that he abolished moral law. He did not even, strictly speaking, as you heard both men say, abolish the ceremonial law, but he fulfilled it, rendering, rendering it no longer necessary. Matthew Henry continues, 
If we consider the law, there's a really good uh, example here, really good imagery here. If we consider the law as a vessel that had some water in it before, he, Christ, did not come to pour out the water, but to fill the vessel up to the brim. Or as a picture that is first rough drawn, displays some outlines only of the piece intended, which are afterwards filled up. So Christ made an improvement of the law and the prophets by his additions and explications. To carry on the same design, the Christian institutes are so far from thwarting and contradicting that which was the main design of the Jewish religion that they promote it to the highest degree. The gospel is the time of reformation, not the repeal of the law, but the amendment of it, and consequently its establishment. End quote. The reason I chose longer block quotations this time is because we just don't have enough time to really get into understanding ceremonial law, moral law, judicial law. Um, there's really not enough time to get any deeper than these quotations of Ford. But I, I do hope that these that this brief introduction to the major categories of the Mosaic Law will at least cast aside several of the more popular arguments for the abolition of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is law found within the moral law, or Ten Commandments. It is part of the moral law, which is unique, timeless, and indivisible. So first, the moral law is unique. It is unique. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, this chapter gives us another account of the Ten Commandments, or the Moral Law. And after enumerating the Ten again, Moses says, picking up in verse 22, These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold! The Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say, and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, Return to your tents. But you stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you possess. The Ten Commandments were uniquely the only commandments that God spoke to the whole assembly of Israel. The Ten Commandments were uniquely the only commandments that God spoke to the whole assembly of Israel. He spoke these and he spoke no more. After they heard the voice of God, the people were so frightened that they asked for God to speak only to Moses, which God approved. And, and it's not as if they, like, interrupted him at 10, and he was about to go on to 11, you know, and they said, no, no, hold on, we can't handle any more. It says that, before that, it says, and he spoke no more. And it was after that point that they said, listen, we can't handle it anymore. This, this, this fear will destroy us. So, 
These commandments, these ten, the moral law, are uniquely the only ones that God spoke to the whole assembly of Israel. Furthermore, the ten commandments were the only commandments God wrote on tablets of stone. The Ten Commandments were the only commandments God wrote on tablets of stone. The moral law is unique. And just as the moral law was written on tablets of stone, only the moral law was written on the heart of the first man, Adam. Only the moral law was written on the heart of the first man, Adam, the works of which are written on the hearts of all his, his posterity. Everyone who comes from Adam, the works of the law are written on their hearts. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. In other words, they don't have the law written down for them. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Now, of course, this must be referring to the moral law, and not, for example, the ceremonial law. Right? The procedures for animal sacrifice, for example, are not known in instinctively, as it were. It's the works of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, that are written on the hearts of men. The moral law is unique. It is these alone that are written on the hearts of men. It is unique, the moral law, in that only it was spoken by God to the whole assembly of Israel, and only it was written by God on tablets of stone and tablets of the human heart. And these facts lead us to our second point, which is that the moral law is timeless. It is timeless. Uh, this really was expressed symbolically by uh, the, their inscription upon stone. Right? They were inscribed upon stone. Writing something in stone symbolizes its permanency. Uh, God could have had Moses bring anything to write on. He chose to have it written on stone, uh, etched into stone. It symbolizes uh, the permanency of a thing. And the fact that the moral law is written on the hearts of men demonstrates its perpetuity, demonstrates its, its timelessness, because generation after generation, God is writing the works of his moral law on the hearts of human creatures. Obviously, it's perpetual, because as soon as someone is born again, the works of that law are being written on that new human creature's heart. As long as there are human hearts, there will be the moral law. As our Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. We read similar language, actually, uh, uh, to Matthew chapter 5, about the law of God in Isaiah chapter 51. Go ahead and turn there. Isaiah chapter 51. Very similar language to what we just read from our Lord. I, I love that, too, when, when you, you know, see reflections of himself in the New Testament from the Old Isaiah chapter 51, and beginning in verse 6, and we'll read just through 8. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings, for the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. The righteousness of God will be forever. Righteousness of God will be forever. And isn't that what we have in the moral law? Isn't that what we have in the moral law, the consummate righteousness of God? And if it is, it is therefore indivisible. If, if it's the righteousness of God, and it is, the consummate righteousness of God, it is therefore indivisible by definition. It cannot be divided. How could a portion of the righteousness of God become unrighteousness? How could part of the righteousness of God become obsolete? The Ten Commandments summed up in the two greatest commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And in 
another place with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's Matthew uh, 22, chapter 22, verses 37 and 30, 39. These could hardly be divided. Could they? These could not be divided. Could they? Tell me. Could one love his neighbor without keeping the Eighth Commandment? You shall not steal. What if he kept all of them, but abolished the sixth? You shall not murder. Could he still claim to love his neighbor? What about the seventh? Could one claim to love his neighbor while committing adultery? The second table of the law, commandments 5 through 10, the table corresponding to the second greatest commandment cannot be divided. What did our brother James say? For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law or of the whole law. Chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. The second table is obviously indivisible. You could not abolish one of the commandments and claim to still be loving your neighbor. What about the first table then? What about the first commandment? Can God be loved without the keeping of the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. What about the second commandment? Shall we abolish the second commandment, make for ourselves idols and call it love? Or maybe we can do away with the third, blessing and cursing from the same lips. These suggestions, I hope, are revolting to you, as they should be. But what is it, then, about the fourth commandment that makes it so easy for men to discard, when in truth it is impossible to love God without it? It is impossible to love God without it. The first commandment teaches us whom we are to worship, and that our souls belong to him, and to him alone. Love the Lord your God with all of your soul. The second commandment delimits how we are to worship. Our minds are to be held captive by the word of God, not vainly devising or imagining worship, but seeking God's face, that we may know what delights him. That's the second commandment. The third commandment teaches us that worship must be done with a right heart. We are to love our God with all of our heart. We're not to take the name of God in vain, worshiping him merely with our lips. That's taking the name of God in vain. We, also, we often think of, of cuss words. But merely uh, worshiping him with our lips and not with our heart. That is a breaking of the third commandment. Our hearts must not be far from him in worship. They must be filled with reverence and awe for God. Our, our souls, our heart, our mind, all of these are those which, with which we are to work. To love our God. What does the fourth commandment teach? What does the fourth commandment teach? It teaches that we are to worship God with our time and with our bodies, with our strength. We're to worship God, to love Him with our strength. All week, all week, we devote our strength to our labors. All week we devote our strength to our labors and even our delights. But one day in seven, we focus all our energy, all our strength on worshiping our great and glorious God and delighting and resting in Him. And that teaches us how we are to use our strength, even in the other six days, of course, as well. Right? Our strength is always to be used to love Him. But it teaches us that we are to love him with our time, with our bodies, with our strength. And similar to what we saw with the second table of the law in James, the first table is, in a negative sense, indivisible as well. Breaking one often leads to breaking another. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 16 says, Because they rejected my rules and did not walk in my statutes 
and profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. They profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. The moral law is indivisible. And since it is indivisible, the Sabbath could not have been abolished. Brothers and sisters, we are obligated, as people of every age, by positive, moral, and perpetual command, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We're called to love our Lord by our obedience, John 14, 15. And we get, we get to delight in the Lord of the Sabbath. It's, it, thinking about my, my life, Many years of profaning the Lord's day. It amazes me that the thought would have been, I have to. I have to spend a whole day. I have to set aside these other things to worship God. It's such folly. I don't say that about murder. I have to. I don't get to kill somebody today. I have to not murder this guy. No, I don't think that way. But in our folly, probably because in a, in a really... Uh, in a really special way, the Sabbath demands that our whole week and our whole lives ultimately are structured around recognizing who is truly Lord, who is truly Master. And uh, in our flesh, we still revolt against that. But we get to delight in the Lord of the Sabbath. We get to delight in the Lord of the Sabbath. Remember our Maker's words to the children of Israel, I gave you the Sabbath. I gave you the Sabbath. In the words of our Lord, the Sabbath was made it is a gift. Let us not be foolish like the Israelites. Let us not be prideful like the French. Know this. Know this, that if you had kept all the law besides and went through your life profaning the Sabbath, as, as many of us once did, but if you had kept all of the law besides, the blood of your beloved would have been just as necessary to propitiate and reconcile us to God as if we had an action broken every law. His blood would have been just as necessary. The Sabbath is not a lesser law. Your Savior died for your profaning of it. Your Savior died for your breaking of it, just as he died for your breaking of the others. And he fulfilled. He fulfilled the fourth commandment, just as he did the other nine. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled all righteousness that you may be reconciled to the Father. He fulfilled all righteousness so that you could be reconciled. You who have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved so that you could be reconciled to the Father. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Didn't he say that? Love God with your strength as well as your heart, soul, and mind. He is worthy of your love. Almighty God, you are worthy for all that you have done, for giving us the Sabbath, a day of rest, for giving us the Lord of the Sabbath, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Redeemer, our King. I simply pray that as we go forth this week, that our minds will be entertained with wonderful thoughts of who you are. We would delight in you. We know that eternal life is to know and to understand you. And we know that one of the reasons you revealed your moral laws is so that we might know you. So I pray that all of these efforts today, I pray that everything that, that has gone on today would be uh, to accomplish that end. And that your people here at Brookside Baptist Church would know and understand you more and love you by keeping your that you would guard them and protect them this week. That you guard them physically, protect them as they return to their homes. Uh, by your grace and mercy, bring us back together, uh, either this Wednesday or this coming Lord's Day. Uh, may we uh, be prepared to rejoice together, because surely in 48 hours, uh, more than we could measure, more than we could count, uh, blessings are in store from, from the God of your nature and character. May we be observant. Be people of great expectation because of who you are. May you guard them also in soul as they go out into a very dark world, a world of uh, 
wickedness and uncertainty from a human perspective. Guard them against putting their trust in princes, against putting their trust in men, but may they put their trust in the living and true God. We praise you and worship you in Jesus' name.